What's up, everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Bartender. Happy late St. Patrick's Day to those that do that sort of thing. Today's episode is straight fire. We are super excited to have Lori Mays on on the program. Don't know Lori? Well, you're gonna. We're gonna talk about why most organizations are still training leaders like it's 1985. Things have changed and Lori gets it. She is a distinguished 25-year executive coach who has provided tens of thousands of coaching sessions to top leaders from Fortune 100 CEOs to venture-backed startups. She's the co-founder, president, and chief coaching officer of Sounding Board Inc., which offers a tech-driven, human-centric approach to leadership development. She's worked with executives at companies like Chevron and Citibank, and she's the author of the book Leadership Revolution, The Future of Developing Dynamic Leaders. This conversation was fantastic, and we're going to move forward from some antiquated mindsets and Bartender Nation, I think you're all going to dig it. So buckle up, TC Beers, grab your favorite cocktail, and let's get right on into it with Lori Maison on today's TCB. Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender, where we gather some of the best HR and people leaders to discuss what's happening on the people side of business. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. Welcome everybody. It is Wednesday. That means it is your favorite day and mine. It's Corporate Bartender Day. Today is the 10th of January, 2024. It's the first of a new year. And I think we should dance. Because it's a new year, new stuff, same crew. <laughs> We are going to get together for the 186th time that we've convened wow. this group of awesome people. I know. <laughs> it's crazy. Today we have a guest. She's the Lori you don't know. We have three Lori's here today. She is the newest Lori of the bunch. Her name is Lori Maison, and she's yeah. a 25 year executive coach who has provided tens of of thousands of coaching sessions to top leaders. So I know Ruby's going to be interested in this one. She's also the author of Leadership Revolution, the future of developing dynamic leaders and is the CEO of Sounding Board. So we're going to get into what is this leadership revolution and why should we care? I always talk a little bit about what hooks me on guests because we get a lot of the same stuff around here. Leadership development. Everybody's got a leadership book. And our leadership book's good. I don't know. In the preface or the foreword to Lori's book, it was written by somebody who said, I hate leadership books. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the hook for me, I got pitched on this segment. And the hook for me was one sentence. And it says, it's the 21st century. Why are we still training leaders like it's 1980? And I was yeah. like, we got to talk to this person. So we're going to get into that. Before we do, though, we've got some guests upcoming. Ruby, I know I'm excited about this. I know you are, too. We got Charlie Gilkey on the show on the 24th of January. He's the author of Team Habits, uh, How Small Actions Lead to Extraordinary Results. Charlie's awesome. Charlie, we, Ruby and I were on Charlie's show uh, in the lead up to our book coming out. What book? Mm -hmm. What book is that? Oh, you know, You, Me, We, Why We All Need a Friend at Work and How to Show Up as One. I said I wasn't going to do that after the birthday of the book, but, you know, it seemed appropriate. So Charlie had us on his show. We talked about our book. So we're going to have Charlie on our show and let him talk about his book. Um, after that, on the 31st, we have Marsha Acker. And she has this Build Your Model for Leading Change book that I thought is really cool. It's a workbook. It's kind of a guided workbook to work through change on a team and i thought that was pretty cool so we've got those two things upcoming we've got a bunch of other things in the pipeline and i'm sure my ridiculous travel schedule will cause me to reschedule one or more of these and cancel something so <laughs> be on the lookout for that but today today we're going to talk to Lori Maison about her book leadership revolution the future of developing dynamic leaders but Lori, we didn't warn you, but we dance everybody on to the show. So let's give Lori a hey. warm TCB welcome, shall we? <laughs> awesome. 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 Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, yeah, <laughs> for thanks bringing for me in with style. <laughs> <laughs> so 
I, I loved I loved the hook, right? Why are we still training people like it's 1980? Why are we developing leaders like we did 30, 40, 50 years ago? And it's funny because in my mind, 50 years ago uh, was, I don't know, when was that? Like 1910, 1920? That's, that's what it feels like to me. Everything was in black and white. We wore those bathing suits with the stripes on them, boxers boxed like this. Um, <laughs> We we still. Oh, that was things. Sockum, Rockum, Sockum robots. Yeah, Remember that? Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Lori, I imagine when you were but a wee child, this isn't what you thought you would grow up to be doing. So, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you end up here, being this coach, guru, author, speaker, and what did you want to be when you were a tiny baby? Oh, God, I didn't even ask that far back. Um, <laughs> when I was a, a tiny baby um, and teenager, I wanted to be a doctor, actually. Okay. And back in the day, you could work very early. So I started working at the Arlington Hospital lab. Um, when, and this is in Virginia, when I was 13. Okay, and, what did you do in the Arlington Hospital Lab? I just like process things and welcome people and fill out forms. But I got to see, then watch the whole lab process. And when I turned 18, uh, they trained me how to draw blood. Ooh. And guess what? I hated that. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of puts the whole doctor thing. At that yeah, point. kind of, kind of ruined that whole dream. So, kind of let that go and went to college and be became a social worker. Okay. And I worked for Children's Home Society in San Francisco for three years. It broke my heart. I couldn't do it for more than that. So I said, okay, what's near to this? And I went and got trained as a therapist and got my license, but also hated that. <laughs> uh, and the reason is you, at that time, it really was healing past trauma model. Oh, and man. so it was all talking about people's past. And I didn't want to talk about that. I wanted to talk about their future. So I kept asking, what have you done differently since the last time? that we met and I kept getting this feedback. No, you can't ask that. That's not what it's mm. about. So I ended up never practicing um, as a therapist. I went and became a professor temporarily because now I had a degree. And in the early 90s, I suddenly heard of this new profession called coaching and they were asking that question and i was like oh my gosh i have found my place so i got <laughs> certified as a coach i was like the first 300 people certified on the planet and put out a license um in 1994 and coached leaders um all the way up through public and private company ceos for 20 years Wow. And after 20 years, I said, okay, been there, done that. Like, what else do I want to do? And I thought I was going to write a book then. And by the way, Charlie, you have one of my titles because I have a title um, for a book, which is Small Action, Big Impact. Oh, call so, Charlie. Call the carpet there you already. go, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, we're going to have to talk. Um, <laughs> but I also have a long this of the martial art called Tai Chi Chuan, which is like the martial form of what older people do in the park in Asia. Okay. And or in San Francisco. So, or in San Francisco. <laughs> and I started writing a book titled Leadership Lessons from the Practice of Tai Chi Chuan. Mm. But before I could finish that book, um, a previous client drew me into a brand new startup. And I was reluctant to join, but ended up joining and ended up loving it. Like mm. growing a company, very similar to growing a leader. And once that company played out, I ended up starting Sounding Board with another previous client, um, really with the goal of- previous clients. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of them over all those years. So with the goal of just bringing coaching as a very viable, a scalable approach to leader development. So then after doing that for about six years, wrote the book that really is our philosophy of how you do that. I love that. Um, 
and it's funny, I, reading through the book, in, in chapter one, it will tell you uh, that story about how you're not allowed to ask the history question. It's more about asking, or how you were sp not allowed to ask the future question, had to ask the history question, and you wanted to do yeah. that flip. Um, this industry that we work in, this leadership development, executive coaching industry, um, yeah. low barrier to entry, anybody can do it. You don't have to try real hard. A lot of people <laughs> don't stick around a long time. And a lot of mm -hmm. us use a lot of the same tools. I mean, we're still hearkening back to, I was on a call the other day, Peter Drucker's name came up and I'm like, really? We're yeah. still talking about Peter Drucker today? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, no offense to to the doctor, former Dr. Drucker, but I mean, haven't we learned new stuff? Why do we, why do, why are we still leaning on these old ideas, Lori? I think we have learned new stuff. It's not just Peter Drucker, like everything that large organizations use was based in the last century. Even the basic training model started around 1960, 70 as a safety approach. All of the assessment programs all were designed last century. Um, really, there hasn't been a lot of new things this century. And the reason I'm an advocate for coaching is it is uh, a nice fit for the current environment where just having generic skill set no longer works. Mm. Like back in the last century, like the workforce was so much more homogenous. The length of time for development was much longer. Like to get up to the executive suite, it was a 20, 25 year pathway. Um, it was 10 years to get to director. Now you can be a director in three years. So wow. how are those people going to be prepared? Like the old way isn't going to going to do it. Um, of course, you have technology, which is just making for information overload. And you also have just a, not, a lot of generations in the workplace now where you had uh, quite a bit less number of generations in the workplace previously. Then you add pandemics, unpredictable environment, the economics, um, you know, work from home, not work from home, hybrid work from home, whatever it is. You add AI in there and you just have this very perfect storm of an unpredictable on um, almost known environment where having a basic set of skills is not going to let you navigate that. Mm -hmm. So we really need just a new way to develop people that help them develop, develop the capacity to deal with the unknown mm -hmm. and to have a, a thoughtful process to how, you know, development is going to happen and how we're going to run our organizations and treat our people. I like that. Just kind of focusing on work the room you're in, right? The ambiguity and change is just, that's just table stakes, right? And so yeah. what are what are the skills for that versus some model for a static kind of environment? Yeah. Yes. Just think like the 360 assessment, right? It was designed to be delivered only once a year or maybe once every two or three years. But as Eric mentioned, a year is like in dog years now. One year is like seven years. <laughs> and you go a month later, everything's different. And what will you feedback you got a year, a month ago, really isn't a fit anymore. Yeah. yeah. Hey, the organization may be 30% different in a quarter. We don't even know, right? Right. But That's Eric, exactly you might right. still be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> That's Laurel Ditson. She'll be here all week, ladies and germs. <laughs> so before we get into your philosophy and, and what's different about the way that you do it, what are some things that we should stop doing, Lori? Are there any any practices that we just need to kick to the curb at this point in time? Oh, my gosh. Well, I can tell you one um, or a few, really, but one big one, which is the old style performance evaluations. Oh, everybody's like, favorite. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's so much research that shows, one, it doesn't influence promotional decisions. 
Two, it doesn't help people be better at their job. Three, it takes up so much time of everyone's time without generating a lot of value. And four, nobody likes it. Why um, does everybody and, still do it, Lori? Everybody does it. <laughs> well, I think there's not a new way to do it because That's look what happened. People dropped it like in from 2000 to 2010. People try to stop doing it. Even GE, mm -hmm. like the famous, I'm going to pit you against your colleague on your rating company. <laughs> um, and they stopped it, but then they didn't know what else to do. And guess what? 2015, there was a resurgence of the use of those old performance evaluations. And I'm just like, no, please. <laughs> Thanks, Jack Welch. It, I, yeah. I've, had, I've had this conversation multiple times with the the CEO of my company, my, my boss, because we all agree, everyone hates them and they're yeah. not super valuable. And yet me as the leader of the HR team keeps perpetuating this thing because I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> what what, what else, else are we gonna then? Do? <laughs> because and and when I talked to Phil about it, I said that um the to me the only backfill for, for that is ongoing coaching and feedback between employees and their manager. Yeah. And some people are super good at that. Most people are not super good at that. And so especially with, in tech. <laughs> right. And so with no structure or no objectivity of consistency, then it's the wild west. And then right. you get into, well, how do we set salary? And then how do we make, right? So it's like some of the, some of the formula that's in the performance review process helps anchor accountability, but right. the experience of it is just the craps, you know? It right. just, so you need the structure, right? So you're getting <laughs> some consistency across the organization around what people are doing, but it can't be the way we um, used yeah. to do it. So we, we use a new model. We call it an alignment conversation. So it's very close to your language and it comes right out of code coaching because we offer these alignment conversations with the manager and someone being developed around what their goals are for the coaching and their leader development. And then we said, like, these are so productive. It closes the gap between the manager and the employee thinking. Mm -hmm. Both sides kind of get motivated. Um, there's clarity and it's forward looking. One thing I always hate about performance evaluations, they're looking in the past. Like if things are going slow and we know next year's gonna be the same as last year, reviewing the past to predict the future might be a good idea, but we're not in that place anymore. Mm -hmm. So we have this alignment conversation process that actually looks to the future mm -hmm. um, and what they're, the employee's gonna be doing this coming year, where they're gonna be having impact, what's their development and getting alignment between the employee and the manager for the coming year. Mm -hmm. Yep, mm -hmm. I love it. Now, it may not predict salaries. One, one thing that the research shows is um, performance evaluations did not influence salary or promotional decisions. Mm. So those actually already happened to be even before performance evaluations were released in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things you can do is just separate those two things. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that. I was always a big advocate of that, even in an excuse me, an old school performance management uh, situation, if we were doing twice a year touches, I always tried to make it, oh, look, this is, thanks, Zoom. Apparently when you do two fingers on Zoom, you get balloons. Oh, is that why that happens? Yeah. Oh, Ruby and I learned this one too the other day. Watch this. <laughs> oh my gosh i have to find out how to do that <laughs> you toys on zoom yeah i know <laughs> and i've been counting things and i put up two fingers and all these balloons come and i'm like stop <laughs> with the balloons <laughs> but if we were doing it twice a year i, would I know get... Laurel. i don't know i'm gonna get it either <laughs> I would always advocate that if we're doing them twice a year, then we're doing salary at one of them and we're doing the real performance conversation on the other one. So right. the midpoint, however your fiscal year is, is defined, the midpoint is just about the money and the other one is the performance conversation. Because right. when you conflate the two, in my experience, uh, the person is sitting there listening, waiting to hear, did I get a bonus? 
or did I not get a bonus? Mm -hmm. And if they got a bonus, now they're not listening because they're shopping in their brain. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and if they did not get a bonus, now they're not listening because they're pissed at you. Yeah, because they're cursing in their brain. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're job hunting in their brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Exactly. And when, you, when you have a pattern of like, we associate merit increases with performance and you have a scale and then there's right. But, but when you really look at the, <laughs> when your scale is zero to 4%, yeah. Then the, the differentiating between a rating of five and a rating of four is like 200 <laughs> bucks, right? After like there's no, it, it doesn't, it and doesn't. Right. <laughs> Right. It's more symbology than it is reality. So and most companies clump all all the ratings around like two of those five points on the scale. Mm -hmm. yes. anyway. So yep. you're either yeah. good or really good or you yep. get fired yeah. last month anyway. Right. Right. So yeah. there's no yeah. differentiation. Yeah. Yes. So I, I like this concept of the align alignment conversation. Um, Ruby will recognize that the align conversation is one of the conversational strategies from Morag's first book, Cultivate the Power of Winning Relationships. Um, <laughs> mm, and there it's you very go. much like Lori described it. It's this sort of forward looking conversation. Um, but I'll ask the I'll ask the tough question. So I, I worked in technology companies for a great portion of my career. Um, it was hard enough to get people to do the performance management thing like we were doing it with a very structured and regimented process. Yeah. To give people an idea and a, you know, a one sheeter and say, go do this on the reg um, right. is really hard. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you yeah. instantiate alignment conversations in a culture? Yes. Right. But you have to do it the same way you create the structure. So the way we've done it is we have a standard set of quest questions that are self-reflective. And then the same set of questions for a conversation. Um, and then we give them feedback based on what they've written that shows the gap between the employee's conversation, you know, thinking and the manager's thinking. And then we direct them to how to have a conversation. Oh, I got Eric going around how to how to close that gap. So notice. It changes the philosophy from the employee is 100% responsible for their performance to that manager and the employee together are responsible for the employee's performance. Because if the manager maybe hasn't been clear about what that employee needs to do, what? or the employee didn't understand exactly like those kinds of things that are very practical, that can actually be improved, show up in these conversations. Mm. Um, and the feedback I've gotten is that both sides like the conversation because it doesn't have that evaluative feel to it. It has a feel of like, oh, how are we going to work better together this year to jointly meet our goal? So it's not combative or confrontational. It's actually collaborative. Mm -hmm. I dig it. Um, and I, I don't mean to rabbit hole in performance management here, but it's it's interesting to me. And um, I think it's relevant to a lot of the folks that pay attention to what we do. So I loved what you just said, Lori, about, you know, there's the there's the self-reflection piece and then there's the more provocatively evaluative piece where the, the manager is answering the same set of questions. Do you espouse those interviews do you do you like them to be i show up with mine and you show up with yours and i haven't seen yours and you haven't seen mine and we're going to see them for the first time face to face because that's nope. what i did and i loved it <laughs> oh you did <laughs> i did because i i inherited this program from somebody else and the employee submitted their self-reflections to their manager and what i learned was most managers weren't writing theirs until they receive the employees yeah. and then yeah. they were oh, using Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, we have them submitted to a third party Oh, who aggregates all the information and then the manager and the employees see the same thing, mm -hmm. which is the gap between their two sets of answers. And then we give it to them in advance because there's the people who can react yeah. in the moment style and there's the people who need to think about it. So we give it to them in advance so people have time to think about it if that's their approach. But as the manager, I can't change my stuff because of mm -hmm. what you said as my employee. I had mm -hmm. so many managers doing that. 
they would yeah. they would have like really tough feedback and get the thing and then they would water it down to where it was nothing or my more enterprising managers would just wait to get them and then mm-hmm. just basically rewrite yeah. what they got so mm-hmm. they were yeah close. but in the reality is they kind of had to do that because who can remember what your employee did right. for the last 12 months right there's a primacy and recency in fact they only remembered what happened at the beginning of the year the end of the year or a giant failure Mm-hmm. They don't right. even remember the giant successes mm-hmm. because those just went by. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah not even no blame for that, really. <laughs> yeah, right. So that's, right. that's one thing we need to do differently. Let's talk about one more thing that you think we ought to do differently, performance management notwithstanding. I think we should stop relying on it, skill development solely. Okay. Like it's been shown for the last 40 years that there's only about a 10% or less transfer of learning from standard training to actual job behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet we are fully relying on that to develop employees and leaders to the point that now our language includes upskilling and reskilling and skill development (laughs) platforms and skills, skills, skills. So again, in my opinion, skills were great when the environment was predictable, when you knew what was going to happen next, what your functional skills of your job, of course, everybody needs skills. But from a leadership perspective, unless you can find a way to up, up level skills to capacities and capabilities, a blending of a multiple sets of skills contextually in the moment, you're not going to be very successful. These uh, days. Ruby Lurie's gotten into our revenue here. So when I edit this out, I'm going to make like a big <laughs> static e channel change in the test screen. <laughs> I, I don't disagree but, with you. Uh, <laughs> I don't well, disagree with you. Sorry, but I also, because you're, yeah, you're no. doing skill training. <laughs> but I also think we uh, we add other things in yeah. that um that complement that, like just how we create peer learning groups. We have coaching hours available to our people to really deeply dive in and apply some of those things. They're mentoring each other. And we always like the only, like our bottom line is intentionality and, and being really clear about what you're trying to do. And like, I think skills are table stakes. I can go learn anything I want on the internet, on the internets. For free. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I do it every day. Yeah, right? right. My mom thinks I'm so smart. I'm like, oh, I'm not smart. <laughs> I just know how to figure shit out. <laughs> YouTube, baby. I, YouTube. Yeah, exactly. I have YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So that's exactly my point. Like when the organizations yeah. just have online training, it's independent, you know, there's no support that. for that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And that that transfer of learning is just so low. And I just yeah. see so many organizations only dependent on that. You need st- skill training. It's not to knock skill training. It's mm-hmm. really just to add what we call the vertical training above, which yep. it, are those capabilities, mm-hmm. capacity the coaching, peer learning, mentoring that helps people transfer that learning contextually into their environment. So I started in in the middle of that whole origin story. I was a corporate trainer in the in the past as well. And I knew in in like that was like in the 90s. Um, and, and I used to teach communication skills, leadership skills, all that kind of stuff. And everyone would ask me like the second half would always be like, but how do I do this in my situation? Mm-hmm. How do I do this with my boss? How do I do that? This with my employee who is like a pain in the neck or whatever it is. They Not all the neck, wanted right. to know that specific individual contextual right. application. And when you have 20, 30, 40, 100 people in a skill training, yeah. you really don't have any space mm-hmm. for that. So there has to be something else if you want any kind of transfer of learning. And what, yeah. I, what I notice is that the, um, the people that have the best success with takeaways and application from those self-paced online kind of in a vacuum kind of skills training are the leaders who are already good leaders. 
because they care and they're looking for what's one more thing I can do or what's right. It's like they kind of naturally want to apply. But if you've got a kind of middle of the road or not so great supervisor in terms of maybe just their instincts or their behaviors or whatever, they're not going to get it from that. They're just going to no. check the box, took that class. Yeah, right? did it and mm-hmm. done, right? And yeah. I do think it's actually a capacity of a leader to be able to sort information and identify what's the couple of things you can actually use to make a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen this in my Tai Chi group too, where we have an interactive form called push hands. It's kind of like sparring, gentle sparring. And people have a really hard time identifying like a theme for how to work with the other person. And if if I point it out to them, they'll be like, oh, oh, yeah. But trying to identify it themselves, they're just looking at so much information. They can't like sort and pick out really what is the most important thing for them. Mm -hmm. So that's how like a peer um, coaching group or uh, a coaching um, facilitator that's really talking about what was important to you. How are you going to apply this? Okay, go apply it and tell us what happened. Come back. Oh, that didn't quite work. Why didn't that work? How are you going to adapt that to your style, to your company, to your context, to your culture? Right. It's a process that really needs to happen for people to utilize the good information that they're getting. Absolutely. This is one of the things Ruby and I talk about all the time. So, you know, I made my joke about cutting into revenue with skills training. Um, But there's a fundamental difference between the work that we do and the way that we do it and sending somebody to a skill path seminar, right? Right. You know, the big... Or just standard online learning, right? Right. Right. But even if it's an in-person thing, it's a one to 45 people. It's a afternoon in a hotel and it, it's not a sticky learning environment. Right. No, and that's we, right. Do, we do multimodal approaches in our program so that you get those things. And we set the expectations with the business at the front end. This isn't a one and done program. Right. If we do that, nothing's going to change. Right. Right. We need to we need to do this with with a enough leaders that we get to a tipping point to where we're altering the way people interact with each other and how they approach problem solving and how they just how they approach their day to day work. And and that takes that takes time. Yes. And so now you're looking at like outcome or impact versus just yes. activity. Correct. You know, I think a lot of companies get focused on, oh, I did the training or didn't do the training. And like you said, check the box. That's just the activity that, you know, doesn't have anything to do necessarily with impact or outcome. So it sounds like you all are really focused on um, that, the you know, tangible, substantial part of it versus the activity. Yeah. Um, I I have a a question for you, Lori, about um, how important is the highest level leadership and their modeling of leadership skills, right? Like how how do do you ever kind of work with teams where you see differentiation of how that impacts, you know, Mm -hmm. the the people's willingness to look at their behaviors based on what they see from their senior leaders? I would say that's probably the number one excuse people give for not adopting something new is my boss doesn't do that. My CEO doesn't do that. My executive team doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So I actually think that's really important Mm-hmm. Um, but I also think from a coaching perspective, you can help le- leaders understand why they should be demonstrating mm-hmm. those capabilities and capacities, even if the other leaders are not. Yeah. Um, so to make separate that a bit. Yeah. I also think that it's really helpful for when organizations have a leadership philosophy and a stated culture that matches yeah. um, because one thing I've seen is, you know, the type of like style of leadership you might have at one company 
at, that is very successful. When you go to another company, it's a total fail. Right. And that's because the, the context in the culture, the philosophy is different. So having that very clear so everyone knows this is our approach to leadership mm -hmm. um, is really useful. And not to take away individual style, right? Sure. But really naming, you know, here's the leadership qualities that we value. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I love that you just said that, Lori. Leadership philosophy. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> I've asked many a potential client in a discovery process, what is your leadership philosophy? And mm -hmm. I've had so many people look at me like I had three heads and they're like, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't even know. I don't even know how to bullshit my way through that question. <laughs> <laughs> so from your perspective, Lori, what is a leadership philosophy? Because you just said it was important to have one. Yeah. So what is that? How would you characterize that for somebody who would be deer in the head lighting me when I ask them the question, what is yeah. your leadership philosophy? I would say it's a, a set of capabilities that the company values, that's based in the company values, that forwards both the success of the business and the success of the culture. Awesome. Yeah. I like that. So it needs to have a, it needs to be based in values because because if it isn't, um, especially those values need to come from the top because who is supposed to be demonstrating it? Those people at the top. And, and man, then yeah. what are the actual be behaviors and thinking that are in line with those set of values? So I'm going like, to tee this up for Lori because she knows where I'm going to go with this. Um, I love that you said values. Values are super important. I've seen values manifest themselves as nothing more than posters in the lobby with words on them like respect, integrity, <laughs> right? Platitudes. Yeah. Um, very yeah. few companies can do the values thing well. Lori's company did it better than I've ever seen it done. Um in a way that the organization, not only can you, you can ask anyone and they, they'll tell you what they are, they'll tell you why they're important, which is a thing oh. that is really tough. So I wanted, I wanted Lori to talk a little bit about that, this Lori, Lori Lance, <laughs> <laughs> and, and tie that to what Lori, yeah. this Lori just said, Lori Bazon. Yeah. Cause that's, yeah, you, you read my mind because that's such a, the worst thing you can do is publish core values or a leadership philosophy that everyone in the building knows is bullshit, right? right. This is not how we do things around here. This is yeah. not how people treat each other. This is yeah. not anything that anybody talks about ever, right? Yeah. It, it's more harmful than if you said nothing. Right. Agreed. A hundred percent. I I was coaching at a, at a very large fortune 10 company and across from the elevators, they had two frames with 20 sets of items in there. And so every person I talked to, I said, what's the top, you know, values or philosophy of the company? Nobody, including all the execs could name even one of those items. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we worked really hard. I won't get into the weeds of that whole process, but I, um, I beat that drum over and over to say, if we don't take this seriously, then don't do it at all. Like don't even touch it <laughs> unless we're yeah. going to take this really seriously. And it was a very collaborative process with representation across the organization with full a hundred percent clarity and support from the CEO. Because again, mm -hmm. if you don't have that, kind of dead in the water and Agreed. it's hypocritical, right? And so what I what I love about, and, and we actually even tied our core values into, I know we're back to the performance evaluation thing, but the one thing that I do like about ours is we do tie assessment of core values, behaviors. We define behaviors additional to just naming core values. And we have four yes. that everyone yeah. can remember. Um, yes. People get assessed on that. So we have a- right what you accomplish and how you do it right yeah. and you can't exist as a talented jerk in our organization right so the how is as important as the what yeah yeah mm -hmm. so taking that into being able to articulate a, a leadership philosophy again the authenticity of those things should look very similar if you yes. have true core values that anchor your culture, then yeah. you can describe those in terms of leadership in a way that people totally get. Right. hundred mm -hmm. mm -hmm. percent. 
All right, Lori, I want you to give us the nutshell. Why should somebody buy Leadership Revolution? What's in it for them? What are they going to take away from it? Oh, and I'll give you a very interesting answer. I decided to write this book really differently than most books. Um, okay. And what I did is write it like a coaching engagement. So sounding, yeah, my company sounding board, we offer a six month, 12 session coaching engagement. So the book has 12 mm -hmm. chapters and it kind of works you through that change in mindset and change in behavior that you get in a coaching um, interaction. And so, for example, though, I was going to uh, circle back to your first thing. It's a new year and wow, wow, wow. Um, the first chapter is called The Big Leap. Because in our our model for coaching, the very first thing we do with the coach and the coach is identify what's the big leap for the person being coached. Mm -hmm. um, and it really starts there. So you can read the book like a leader and actually develop yourself. You can read the book as a coach and learn a coaching um, mm -hmm. structure. And you can read that as a learning and development professional or people professional um, and change your thinking and mindset about, you know, the programming and development that you're delivering. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's awesome. an author I really love. His name is uh, John McPhee. He's an older author and he wrote um, a book called Levels of the Game. And it's about Arthur Ashe joining um, the totally white uh, tennis culture and he wrote it this way with the basis of it being a tennis match that Arthur Ash was playing so mm -hmm. I credit him with the idea my publisher which which is Wiley pretty good publisher they were they were like um you're not John McPhee I don't know if you can pull that off <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you and I'm like well yeah jobs. I really am not John McPhee but let's give it a shot <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, Lori, I could talk to you all day. I think we're going to have to have a, a part two here in a few months uh, because there are some things I want to go deeper on um, and, and more powerful conversations that I think we can have. But given that your focus is on coaching, I know Ruby's got questions, so I'm going to open it up for questions. She's been She's been furiously taking down notes. Uh, I bet she's already ordered your book. So <laughs> I'm going to open it up to questions and then we will get on with our end of show party and uh, go have some dinner. So Ruby, what right. you got? Sassy Lori. Ruby, <laughs> sassy, sassy Lori. Lori. Hmm. <laughs> Lori's actually sassy and the other one's actually sassy and Lori is on your sassy. So yeah. I probably should have picked a different adjective. Um, <laughs> Just my question really is from a like coaching perspective, Lori, um, given just your experience and your depth um, of just working with so many people, um, what's been your biggest learning or um, that's a huge question, but what's, what's like really, maybe it's more like what's really here for you now as a coach, like what are you leading with or what's really important to you now? Great question. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny because I think my intent has always been the same, which is big impact, like making a big change with people. And mm -hmm. I almost am like, you know, I'm putting my time into this. You're putting my time into this. If we're just going to do like little stuff, like I don't think it's worth it. Right. Yeah. Uh, so let's like make a big leap. Let's make a big change. And I think there's a few parts to that. One is really identifying um, the thinking of where they are now and any, you know, beliefs, mindsets, pieces that are getting in their way from them imagining something bigger, better, more mm. impactful, more satisfying, um, yeah. be more effective, and then reworking their thinking about it, and then aligning up behavior that matches mm. that new thinking. 
So that thinking and behavior alignment is what lets this stick over time. It doesn't have to be in that order, though. Like you all, if you're changing behaviors, you want that behavior to stick, then you need to make sure the mindset, thinking, belief system all matches that new behavior. And now you don't have any cognitive dissonance. Yeah. So you can make much imp- more impactful change that lasts over time because the standard is you learn a new skill and it's good when times are good and under stress, you just forget all of that and go back to whatever was your natural. So you really have to change what your fallback position is to your new position mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. instead of keeping your old position. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was talking to somebody today, um, one of the, young women that I, that I mentor and she was the, the vocabulary that she was using was very telling about the mindset. And so my Mm -hmm. suggestion was, can you think of a word to replace that? Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. the words you're using, first of all, it's self-critical and it's, it's a limiting belief. So Mm -hmm. she was, she was calling herself lazy when she wasn't in Mm -hmm. constant motion. And I said, can you reframe Mm -hmm. that? to be yeah. your recharging or you're mm. caring for yourself, right? Because the mantra in her head is lazy, 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 super hard to change behaviors when you put that vocabulary on it. So I was, it yeah. just, it, mm-hmm. it just triggered that whole mindset piece. So much of that is word choice and mm-hmm. needing, to, needing to change the vocabulary yeah. that we use. Yeah. A hundred percent language is so revealing. Yeah. Um, and that is one of the ways co- the coaching industry might use AI is just, um, you that repetitive language, like we've done just some fun experiments and we'll find people will say like in a coaching session, they'll say the same word 10 times, mm. like good coaches are going to pick that up right away, away and be like, what's going on with that? Yeah. Uh, but if you have even novice coaches or managers who are using coaching skills, you'll be able to prompt them like, Hey, this person repeated this word, ask them what's going on about that for them. Mm-hmm. Right. Interesting. So I think, yeah, the language, I think, is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Awesome. I see uh, Ms. Ms. Freemeyer has her hand up. Yeah. Another Lori. (laughs) Um, Only Lori is allowed on here, yes. (laughs) (laughs) It's been torture, let me tell you. Um, I've had granddaughter duty this week, so that's a a good thing. But um, in any event, um, for the record, I'm known as being feisty, not sassy. So just so you know, um, Lori Feisty Freemeyer. But uh, no, seriously, uh, you know, it's interesting because I I have my private coaching practice, which is one thing. And then I'm an in-flight support coach at an airline. And we are, as of last week, we have our third new vice president leader in my seven years at the company. And... um, as we all know, you know, somebody new comes along, oh, they've got to shake things up. They've got to, you know, just stir the pot just to make change for the sake of making change. So it looks like they're doing something. Mm. And uh, <laughs> yeah, we really all know that. So. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. I'm just like, oh, great. I got to train another one. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> no, but, you're uh, totally right. You're being completely <laughs> honest. <laughs> <laughs> so that being said, yeah, me still sitting in the car. Here. Here you are. I'm not driving, not driving. Um, mm-hmm. But no, it's everybody wants a quick fix. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, morale, culture, whatever it is, they want to implement their ideas because they think their ideas are the best. So, of course, we have to deal with ego and all that other stuff. Um, now, the guy that they just hired, he two things. He's from a different culture, and he's significantly younger than the previous VP. So I'm, I'm very interested to see what's up with him. And when I sent out, he did a little video he sent out to all of us. And I looked him up on LinkedIn sent him a request with a little note and he responded like within an hour. It was pretty interesting. So um, I'm like, okay, well, let's see what you're made of here, buddy. But, um, (laughs) but I just, you know, what's the leadership topic of the day or, you know, I really appreciate Lori, what you're presenting and I'm looking forward to looking into your book here too. But um, those of us who are sort of in the trenches, if you will, if we continue on doing what we know to be the best and um, best practices or 
um, trying to look out for the other people as opposed to making our own selves look good, you know, the, the focus off of ourselves. I have found that to be the most reliable thing. And, and I was very encouraging about a month ago. Um, you, you know, we, we every now and then we'll have big dogs on, on our planes. And this gal was on the plane. And, you mean like um, a real dog, Lori, not like big dog? No, like, oh, no, no. Dog. <laughs> I, I love having the dogs on. They're, they're the best passengers ever. But, mm-hmm. um, but this gal um, from the head office, she identified herself and she said, I just love, I can just tell you are so welcoming and you're tra- I was training somebody and, uh, or the, the final step of the employee support coach, which is still training. And she said, I could just tell that person, uh, was in really good hands. And she just, I mean, she just was very edifying. And I, and I kind of looked at her and I said, okay, so what's your takeaway? <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, what, what do we need? How can we be better? What, what needs to be done? Um, and she just said, you know what, you actually were putting into practice, yes, the corporate values that um, we don't see lived out every day. And I was just kind of like, OK, so getting back to the whole values piece, you know, when somebody notices when you have 3000 of you, um, that was pretty cool. Um, but I, I think, mm-hmm. too, we all know you do the right thing regardless of whether anybody's looking. And well, that's uh, the, the real leadership, right? The real leadership yes. is it's not about you. It's about everybody mm-hmm. outside of you. Exactly. Uh, can I quickly comment on your thing about a new VP? Um, yes. this, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get total backlash for this, but <laughs> yeah. there is a book and it's called The First 100 Days. And it suggests for new employees to find the low hanging fruit and make all those changes right away. Mm, And that is the most irritating um, (laughs) poor (laughs) advice, because if it really was low hanging fruit, people would have already done it. And coming in and trying to tell people that they didn't handle low hanging fruit and now you are going to do it (laughs) doesn't go over very well. It makes everyone feel like they haven't done their job. And so I just Uh feel like um, that's a common philosophy now from that book that is really uh, anyone that comes to my company, I tell them in the very first meeting, you are not doing anything about low hanging fruit. Don't read this book. If you read it, don't use it because that doesn't work here. Um, So I I think there's a approach to that, that many people are taking up. That's really, in my opinion, not very effective. Active. That's hilarious. interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing well, that. Lori, yeah. where do we find you if we want to learn more, if we want to contact you, if we want to buy your book? Where do we find you on the big wide interwebs? Well, you can find me on LinkedIn, Lori, L O R I, Maison, M A Z A N. By the way, other Lori's, there's only maybe one other Lori Maison on the entire planet. So for some reason, I don't know why, but you can always <laughs> find me. Um, the book's on any place you can buy a book, Amazon, it's there. And then you can email me at Lori at Sounding Board Inc. Dot com, and you can see the company on the web at Sounding Board Inc. Dot com as well. Awesome. Her name is Lori Maison. Her book, Leadership Revolution, The Future of Developing Dynamic Leaders, is available wherever fine books are sold. Lori, thanks so much for being with us here today. Thank you. What a fun fun. group. And like I said, we're going to have to schedule that part two because there's more conversation to be had. But let's get into our funny things, good feels, silly cocktail, and go have some dinner Funny thing number one, these are all work-related this week. They're either about email or office culture, because I think you guys can relate. Funny thing number one, I'm sorry I haven't replied to your email, but I glanced at it, vowed to deal with it later, and now the very thought of even opening it fills me with crippling dread. Anybody been there? Ruby, you got to come off mute so I can hear you laugh. (laughs) <laughs> yes, I'm Funny going through that because I just returned from big. <laughs> Funny thing number two, I know you've done this, Ruby, because I've done it too. Ready? Did you ever send a work email and then reread it and congratulate yourself on the masterpiece that it was? <laughs> <laughs> number three, 
There's literally no law that says you can't put your friends down as references and pretend they were your boss at your old job. Literally, there's no law that says that. <laughs> Hey, when and, I worked uh, retail and somebody wanted to talk to the manager, oh, you yeah. put your hand over the phone and you say, who wants to be manager today? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all done something yeah. as shady as that, <laughs> Laurel. <clears throat> Next one. The best email signature I've ever seen. It's normal for me to take two days to read my emails and two more days to reflect on the matter and respond <laughs> Oh, calmly. I love this one. The culture of immediacy and the constant fragmentation of time are not very compatible with the kind of life I lead. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, see, I told you, you would relate to these. <laughs> I have never come back from any holiday feeling relaxed, refreshed, and reinvigorated to get back to work. I come back with the taste of freedom still fresh in my mouth, a renewed hatred for work, and a strong suspicion that this is not what I should be spending my life doing. <laughs> oh my God, these are just too true. <laughs> yep. Ruben, this one's for you. I hope this email finds you well, how the email found me. <laughs> Cat. Has he anyone told you you spend kidding. too much time on X? <laughs> yeah. I don't call it X, Laurel. It's Twitter. Uh, oh <laughs> this, I have had to do this very Oops. thing as an HR professional. Um, I didn't use this graphic, but I had to send a note with this same message in it. I actually had to put this sign up at the bathroom at my work. Yep. Oh, no. This is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I had a job one point in time where I had to let somebody go for not using the toilet at all, but using uh -huh. the middle of the floor. Oh, wow. HR stories. HR stories. <laughs> but I think we can all relate to this last one here. This was my funniest favorite thing. After the meeting, coworker let me know that I looked naked and frustrated the whole time. <laughs> Come on, Lindsay. <laughs> uh, wow. <laughs> All right. Today's good feel story is a follow up from one that was happened about a year ago. It's about the geese and you know, make us tear up every week. I know. So touching. <laughs> and I dry oh, up God. those tears with my silly cocktail. Today is called Moose Lick. <laughs> it's a riff on the Moose Milk <laughs> cocktail, which is the real thing created by the Canadian military. This makes two, by the way, this recipe. You're going to need eight <laughs> ounces of cold coffee. Parks Canada have put out this helpful message. You can see on the right side on these two signs, do not let moose lick your car. You're going to need a little bit of half and half because moose are licking the road salt off of cars. You're going to need some vanilla ice cream. It is bad because it causes the moose to lose their fear of roads and vehicles. You're going to need a little bit of just alcohol because this was created by the military to get rid of excess alcohol that they had. You can make it with rum, whiskey, vodka, whatever. Just put liquor in it. Um, they can't really stop the moose from licking the cars. Uh, you can flavor it with Kahlua if you like. And I thought this was funny. It made me giggle because they listed this as a safety statistic, as in they're trying to help the moose population stay vibrant. Um, nearly four moose a year are killed on the roads Aww. in Alberta. Four. Not 40, <laughs> not 400. <laughs> four moose. <laughs> but they want to save those four. That's yeah. Right. They do. Lori, thank you so much for being here with us today. This has been a super fun conversation. We will see you all next week, and we'll do it all again. Have good nights, everybody. Take care. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a good time and learned a thing or two at today's happy hour, please share it with your friends. If you want to join our tribe, head on over to skyteam.cloud forward slash TCB or email us at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again, and remember, you've always got friends at the Corporate Bartender.